Hi, I'm Kay Havens, and I'm happy to be participating in this symposium on the National Seed Strategy. I'm going to be talking today about uh, goal one, assessing supply and demand for native seed in the United States. I should start by pointing out that there is an awful lot of land that needs restoration in the US. Over 10 million acres have recently burned or are infested with weeds. And this represents a huge restoration debt for the US. In the US, restoration is seed limited. So the Bureau of Land Management is probably the largest seed purchaser in in the world, um, but certainly in the Western Hemisphere and in a bad fire year, uh, they can purchase up to 7 million pounds of seed. Um, often they're not able to get the taxa or the provenances or ecotypes that they prefer and often have to resort to purchasing non-native species for restoration after wildfire. About uh, six years ago now, um, the federal agencies in the US, as well as a number of nonprofits, um, came together to create the National Seed Strategy. Uh, right now, we are reporting on progress made in the first five years and um, also revising the strategy uh, for the upcoming years. Um, the, the purpose of the strategy is to put the right seed in the right place at the right time. And accompanying that strategy was a business plan that estimated it would cost about $360 million to fully implement the strategy. Unfortunately, that level of funding has not been attained. Uh, so many of the goals in the original plan have not been met. Um, but one of them uh, in, in the first uh, goal one, uh, assessing nationally the need for seed and availability is now underway. One of the reasons um, it became clear that we needed to do a national assessment was in many parts of the US, um, the seed we want or the provenance uh, we want is not available. So this is work done by Beth Ledger and her students uh, looking at seed available here in the Great Basin of the United States. And what they found were most uh, seed available for purchase came from uh, the north, cooler and wetter areas than in the Great Basin. What's for sale is mostly grasses and mostly cultivars, uh, cultivars that are selected for agronomic qualities, um, not necessarily for strong root systems that help them persist in a changing climate. And there were limited collections uh, available of woody plants and forbs. And this probably won't come as a, a surprise to anyone in this audience, but it is important to have the right seed. Uh, locality or provenance matters. And this is just one of probably hundreds of studies that have looked at local adaptation. This done in Wyoming Big Sagebrush. A common garden was planted here in Glens Ferry, Idaho, uh, with seeds sourced from uh, throughout the Western US. And after 20 some years, uh, when folks returned and looked at survivorship in that common garden, the only accession that was 100% still alive was the local uh, ecotype, and others had lost 50% or more of the plants. So I focus mainly on the West, but I work in the Midwest, so I want to point out some of the differences between restoration in the Western US and the Midwest and East. Um, where I work uh, in the greater Chicago area, we're often doing smaller scale projects with predictable disturbances. So we're restoring after um, agricultural use. Um, we have larger seed transfer zones so we can move seed further and still have it succeed. And we kind of know how plants are responding to climate change. They're for the most part moving north and east. And contrast that with the west where we have very large um, disturbances, very large projects. Um, usually after wildfire, uh, smaller seed transfer zones, and how plants are responding to climate change and moving is much less predictable. So in the tall grass prairie where I work, um, it's one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. Um, and we've been doing restoration for nearly a century, and remnant prairies can contain upwards of 350 plant species. 
And we know we want diversity, but diversity can be measured in many different ways. Um, it can be species diversity, genetic diversity, phylogenetic diversity. Um, so how many branches of the tree of life are represented? Phenological diversity, do we have plants that bloom over the entire season? And functional trait diversity, do we have different kinds of plants performing different function, functions? And this is work by um, Becky Barak for her dissertation. Um, and she looked at um, both species richness and phylogenetic diversity in remnant and restored prairies and compared that to um, the seed mix that was used uh, to create the restored prairies. So let's focus on this panel here in the upper right. And uh, the green uh, represents the seed mix. So how much diversity was present um, that went into the restoration. The purple represents diversity in the restoration. And then the blue in the middle is uh, remnants for comparison. And what you can see is pretty much what goes in is what comes out in restorations. And in both species richness and in phylogenetic diversity, that is considerably less uh, than what is uh, present in remnants. The only um, measure that didn't show this pattern was mean C or coefficient of conservatism. And she found that we're planting an awful lot of conservative species but those are not coming out in restoration. So in some ways we're uh, wasting time, money, effort um, on trying to restore species that uh, just aren't performing for us. She looked at um, what branches of the tree of life were missing in uh, seed mixes. And what she found probably isn't surprising. It's things that are really hard to propagate or expensive to produce. So lilies and orchids, and hemiparasites and parasites are largely um, what isn't available in the trade. And so if we take this and other work um, that we've done together and ask if we're meeting diversity targets in our restoration, the answer is no. So if we look at a reference community and how diverse it is, what we can purchase to um, restore a community like that is limited only about half of the native prairie taxa are available in the trade. <coughs> and even once we sew those in, there are a number of factors from genetic to biotic and abiotic factors that relegate many species to the dark diversity and our restored communities are fairly depauperate by comparison to reference communities. So what we're learning is our restoration practices are really shifting what prairies look like and how they function. Uh, they're missing branches of the tree of life, they're missing um, spring blooming species, and um, this is not good. We need to figure out how to do better. So um, that all of that is uh, focusing on what species are available for restoration, but beyond that, we're also concerned about provenance. Where do those, um, where are those species sourced from? And we want them sourced from a region that is similar in climate and soils and other factors so that they'll be adapted uh, to the site where the restoration occurs. <coughs> Most people are using these um, provisional seed zones that are based on uh, winter temperature and elevation and um, ecoregion. Uh, but some agencies and municipalities uh, use a sourcing system that is far more conservative. Um, this from the forest preserves of uh, Cook County, Illinois. Their preferred seed zone is Cook County, Illinois. And so it's not only difficult to get the species you want, it's even more difficult to get the sources you want. So that leads me to the national assessment um, for the need for native seeds and their, the capacity for their supply. Um, we have released the interim report last fall um, and it focuses on the seed supply chain, uh, makes some preliminary observations, and describes how we will collect data to finish um, our final report, which is due out this fall. So of the eight preliminary observations made in the interim report, I want to highlight um, these two. Um, first, the time frame, the quantity and quality 
uh, strongly limit the overlap between what seed is available and what seed is desired. So um, we can't usually get what we want. And uh, the other observation is that seed choices do not always support restoration success and outcomes do not always inform choices. So we're not learning from what we're doing. Um, I wanna point out that this is not um, in the interim report. This is uh, kind of my own work on what a robust national native system um, might look like for seed. And I think there's several components. Um, one are policy actions that we need to take. We need to protect natural areas so they're not over collected. We need to select um, some areas where we're only restoring um, with regionally sourced native plants. We need botanists who are making decisions about uh, seed needs. In production, we need regional seed hubs, seeds, um, are inherently a regional product. They should be collected, increased, and used regionally. So um, kind of a distributed uh, way to source seed in the US. Uh, we need something akin to plant material centers focusing on native plants <coughs> um, to do research and share that with growers. Um, there may be some uh, some species that aren't uh, profitable for growers, and so they may need to be produced um, by the agencies themselves. Uh, we need more proactive restoration, more cold storage. We need to learn from our restorations, and we really need to incorporate science into everything we do. And this is just one way um, to incorporate provenance trials in um, every restoration that we undertake. So we can um, use seeds from different sources, embed that in a restoration and learn from our successes and failures. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much.